Hello, everyone. I am Erlisha Rochelle, the National Ambassador for St. Germain, and welcome to Liqueurs Through the Ages, the 20th Century. As you just saw, liqueurs have had a defining moment in cocktail culture from the 15th century to modern day. And today, I'm going to be visiting some of the most renowned bartenders in the world to talk about some of our favorite 20th century cocktails. First up, I'm taking you to Paris to visit my friend Sarah Modelou at La Commune. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, Alicia. I'm very well. Thank you. And you? I'm doing amazing. It's so great to see you. I haven't seen you since before COVID. Um, actually, my last trip out of the country or anywhere for that matter um, in France uh, in January when you were getting ready for Bacardi Legacy, which you went on to win. Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah. We're done. Amazing. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I know you're all the way in uh, Paris at La Commune, um, but what we really wanted to talk about today was the aviation cocktail. So we know that we are exploring all about the 20th century cocktails and really looking at how liqueurs really had a defining, um, you know, defining place in cocktail culture especially in the 20th century when cocktails really started to become the thing, right? Um, and the aviation being one of those quintessential cocktails from the Art Deco era. Um, and I would love to hear about your take on the aviation. Uh, well, aviation, as you said, it's just one of the oldest cocktails as appears, I think, in 1916. Yeah. Um, it's, it's like kind of sour drink that just goes through the time and never stopped to evolve. Uh, the first writing down was with Crème de Violette and Maraschino, and then after the Violet Cream just disappeared of the recipe uh, to come back later on. So it shows how, how the drinks can just evolve with a uh, flavor with people and, uh, and interaction with products. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, is that the color, right? The, the, the color of the Crème de Violette that reminding you of a sky blue um, is something that was really captivating during the, the, the 1920s um, when this cocktail really started to be um, enjoyed, especially all throughout Paris. And, you know, I just read a really interesting point because of the name aviation. It also was around the same time period where people were starting to fly. So like the affluent had this luxury new transportation so i feel like the aviation was really this kind of escapism right this 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 portal to another world um that is really exciting because when you think about our deco culture is really about all different kinds of cultures coming together and i think this cocktail really um lends to that idea of these different worlds coming together um and i think that's what really makes the aviation just such a special cocktail. But we don't really see Creme de Violette being used that often. So in terms of looking at a more uh, modern take on it, I know you've done some really uh, cool techniques with um, your take on a modern aviation. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, I like the aviation, as you said, because there's a uh, history behind it. Uh, that, that year was the one when they was traveling everywhere around the world. And if you go through it, I think every single month there was like improving uh, about like flying. Uh, and my interpretation was to give a new dimension to the aviation, which is basically a sweet sour drink uh, with beautiful color. Uh, I couldn't take out the color because as you said, it's making skin about sky. And I think by that moment with everything that happened, a little bit of blue in our life just make us more fancy, uh, but I keep uh, the idea of a long drink, quite refreshing, mm -hmm. a bit more low ABV, uh, and I try to, to bring uh, as the concept of La Commune and the Syndicat Cocktail Group, only French spirits. Uh, so it stays instead of gin of Armagnac. Um, mm -hmm. Armagnac is generally uh, quite similar to Cognac, but a different way of distillation and obviously the notion of terroir but it's basically this, um, so a bit more flavored because during the distillation, it will not be in contact with the air. So there's no, no part of flavor that's gonna take out of the product. Uh, I decide to use Saint-Germain, obviously. Uh, it's just gonna bring kind of like flowery aroma, uh, slightly bit fruity. Uh, there's no lime, no citrus in it. So it's just a soda. 
uh, a soda based on a salt solution with spiruline, uh, which is like a cyanobacteria. Cyano is coming from the fact that it's blue. So that gives the color instead of the violet cream. Infused with some rose, uh, a lot of violets to keep the direction of the, the basic aviation. And I'm gonna add as well a bit of poaching. Uh, I know some people will say, she said French project, why she's saying poaching? Uh, we do have an amazing poaching in France, uh, which is not quite punchy as a poaching could be. But it's you might have like, to explain what that is for some people who may not know. Oh, as unaged whiskey is part of the moonshine. So it's quite high volume alcohol and a quite rough product generally. Uh, that one is way more delicate. Uh, it's very on the floral notes. So it's just going to bring all the flower and the drinks all together. So here is my twist on uh, aviation. As you can see, it's right down just over there. Uh, slightly blue, so we keep the color of the, um, well, the DNA color of the, the original drinks. Yeah, but which I have. It's, oh. it's quite similar. Yeah, I love it. And I'm just gonna serve it to an eyeball. I would say it's quite like dedicated blue, as you can see in a really fancy country. I love it. Just adding a little bit of lemon wedge on it, just to keep the idea of something quite citrusy in the nose at least. And it's just gonna bring a contrast of color of the blue and yellow as the sun in the sky. Sante. Cheers. It looks stunning. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this journey. And I hope to see you soon at La Commune in Paris. I hope as well, really soon. Can't wait for it. Thank you so much, Alicia. Bye. Bye. Next up, we're headed to DC to visit Glenn and Hartley from Service Bar. I could not be more excited to be here with one of my favorite people, Glendon. How are you, my friend? I'm doing fantastic. Good to see you. I see you're painting away. I can't wait to get into all that you've created for us. Definitely, definitely. So when I was thinking of who I wanted to talk about the sidecar, obviously you were the first person that came through my head because you are the king of all things brandy related. But I really want to know from you, why do you think the sidecar has really stood the test of time? That's an excellent question. Um, for me, I think the sidecar has um, a place in everyone's heart. Um, it's got cognac, it's got citrus, uh, sugar, all of which were not readily available at certain times in Europe and the world. Um, so, you know, it's made up of things that were not really um, accessible before the 1600s. Um, and, you know, once they put it into this cocktail, um, well, with the exception of the Brandy Crusta, uh, the sidecar being uh, an extension of that or a, uh, what do you call it, a... Uh, a trade-off of that, spin-off, sorry. Spin-off, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, spin-off of the, uh, the Brandy Cresta. Um, it, it marries like so many things from so many different parts of the world. Um, and you know, I, that's why I think it stands the test of time. Um, this, whomever invented uh, this cocktail or the way that this cocktail is made um, with crusting the sugar on the glass, which is what I'm doing right now, um, was a genius. And uh, it's definitely been a showstopper ever since. So that, along with the combination of, you know, the sidecar being a, a blend of spirits and, uh, and ingredients from around the globe, um, that's why I think it, it'll always be here. And it'll always stand the test of time. Absolutely. I think, I, I think you've put some really, um, like, key factors um, in terms of talking about kind of this global context of having all of these different things from different parts of the world, which in the 1920s, you know, no one really had access to those. And it was just starting to come about in terms of normal life, you being able to go to a bar um, and, and be able to have and taste these different 
cultures and, and different things from around the world. So I think that's a really, really great um, aspect to this cocktail. So I know you have created your own riff on a sidecar. I would love for you to walk us through what you've done with this cocktail today. Perfect. And I, uh, I hope I don't offend anyone out there, uh, cognac drinkers or, you know, French people <laughs> or <laughs> English people. Um, but, um, you know, this cocktail is made up of ingredients from all over the world. So I felt that it was necessary to integrate it into, you know, whatever we have going on in the world right now or, you know, at any given time. So instead of cognac, uh, which is one of my favorite brandies, hands down on the planet. Um, I'm using Pisco. Um, Pisco is made of grapes just like cognac, but it's not aged. And uh, it has like a really floral um, and not necessarily as much floral, whereas it's fresh. It has a very fresh brandy flavor. And um, I feel like it goes best with Saint Germain because Saint Germain is so fresh and floral and fragrant. Um, and they, they complement each other. So yeah. I've just done my orange twist here. Um, so now I'm going to do my twist. So I'm using clarified citrus. Um, it's basically citrus just with the, uh, all the pulp and the, um, and the solids taken out um, and it ends up clear. So I'm gonna put 25, uh, 0.25 ounces of that in my cocktail. Um, and that's going to be my lemon. Citrus is already in the, in the sidecar. My twist also involves jasmine tea. Um, mm. You know, Saint Germain, it's so floral and fragrant. Um, I felt like the jasmine tea would be the perfect addition to it. I'm going to put an ounce of that. And now for my brandy, um, I'm going to use a, a Torrentel Pisco um, that I have here but I'm only gonna put in 0.75 of an ounce because um, like we said, uh, you know, Saint Germain is the star of this show um, and I would like it to remain so, but with some type of, you know, full spirit backing and uh, the Torrentel Pisco does well to do that. And so now I'm gonna add my 1.5 ounces of Saint Germain and um, these flavors are gonna blend together so nicely. I was so happy when this cocktail uh, worked out because uh, I, I really wanted to make a clarified version of, the, of a regular sidecar, um, but with the addition of the Pisco, everything was so nice and floral and it all you know, blended together so well. Um, it made me very happy and I'm sure whenever you get to try this, you're gonna like it. I cannot wait. I mean, I can only just imagine how aromatic because you've used elements that just have such a beautiful floral, um, but different kinds of florals. So I can only imagine how intoxicating this cocktail is. Um, I'm stirring it because... Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, I don't need to shake it because, um, like I said, my citrus has all the solids taken out. So you just get that uh, citric acid flavor to balance the cocktail out. And uh, I no longer have to sh shake it to uh, create, to aerate it and make the densities the same. So this cocktail is gonna sit heavy on your palate. Mm. It's gonna be fragrant. It's gonna be amazing. It's a full experience. So I'm gonna do that. I got my nice uh, Art Deco mixing glass here to kind of I see that, very 1920s. <laughs> <laughs> okay, as I pour here, I'm gonna kind of zest my orange. There we go, and then I'm gonna add even more zest on top. So what I was painting the glass with earlier was Saint Germain that I put in the dehydrator for 24 hours. It is so concentrated and delicious and uh, it works well for painting because every time you take a sip of the drink, 
you're going to get this nice concentrated flavor of Saint Germain with the sugar to balance out the cocktail that's inside with all the floral and citrus aspects. And uh, you know, this is gonna be a cocktail that I hope people will love for a long time. And uh, this is all due to you, so. Oh my gosh, to you. Dante, to you, it looks, it sounds, I just, uh, I'm doing a classic I love it. Um, sidecar with St. Germain, but I really can't wait to get to Service Bar in DC and try this beautiful cocktail. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us and taking us on a journey to Sidecar, and I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you for having me. See you soon. Bye. Last up, we'll finish it off with Ezra Starr, bar consultant. Well, today is a very lucky day for me because I get to bring one of my favorite people to work today. Hello, Ezra Starr. Hello, Alicia. So happy to see you. Really happy to see you. So today we're going to be talking about 20th century cocktails and looking at the role that liqueurs really made in um, supporting those cocktails. And today we're focusing on the last word. I know the last word for me was um, a love affair and honestly is the reason why I wanted to be a bartender the first time I tasted that cocktail. Now was the last word a love affair for you the first time you had it? Well, no. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't believe that. You totally struck me as a person who like who absolutely loved the last word. You know, um, so I tasted it and it took me a long time to really wrap my head over the flavor of maraschino. I did not understand what it was. I did not understand why you would use it and eventually as I started tasting more things and expanding my own palate, I was like, oh, this thing is actually really delicious. And I, that I think was my initial turn off to it. And I loved chartreuse already. I loved gin and all of it together finally clicked. And now I look at it as such a brilliant single piece of cocktail making. The structure of the drink, the way that it's four parts sour instead of the usual three parts sour and all parts are equal. Nothing is really showing through more than anything else. Um, it actually has become one of my absolute favorite things to riff off and play with when guests come in and ask for uh, a drink that's just off the top of my head. I can be like, oh, I can put these four things together if they're kind of within the sugar taste and this like citrus or whatever it might be. If I balance them just right, you can let all of them shine together instead of having something just centrally showcased. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're, you're talking about, you know, the foundation of creating cocktails and the last word really pushed that. Um, at, at a very early time, right, um, where people were creating cocktails in, in a very specific way, and the last word was really a rift on that. Um, but another thing that I really found interesting of the last word is that, you know, this was a cocktail that supposedly was created in the United States. At the end of the day, we have no idea where cocktails were made um, because no one was writing things down and everyone was having cocktails, so who knows? Um, but we believe that it was uh, created in the United States, but it used um, liqueurs from all over the world. So this whole like global aspect to the cocktail, which I found um, really inspiring, you know, especially in thinking of today where like it's so difficult to travel and how important it was to be able to taste from different cultures. And so I know you have created your own um, version of the last word today. Can you talk us through what you created and kind of your thought behind it? Absolutely. So for me, the cocktail is a taste of different cultures all put together. And the last word is such a beautiful example of that. Um, you know, gin, so I wanted to keep all those little elements. So I kept the gin part, the citrus, I kept the citrus and I used lemon instead of lime because a lot of old cocktail books, you don't know if it's lemon or lime, it'll just say citrus and you have to kind of figure out what they had at that time period. And what we have now is completely different than what they had fruit wise too. So really it's kind of open end when it comes to citrus. And then I wanted that stone fruit flavor still. So I used some apricot because I find mm -hmm. that like maraschino has those like apricot-y flavors and tones. And then I really wanted a central picture of a French liqueur and what is this like beautiful quintessential French liqueur that I could use. And I was like, oh, Saint Germain is a great one. And putting all, all of them together in equal parts um, really made so much sense. And the first time I had a, um, a last word was with, was sent to me, a guest was sent to me by a wonderful gentleman named Murray Stenson, who was working at the Zigzag in Seattle at the time. And they had a $20 bill and he had written across it 
please take care of my friends. So I thought oh, I'll just name this cocktail for him. It was such a brilliant idea of how do we expand our bartender community? How do we bring in all these elements from around the world and share them with people, which is what drinking with friends and drinking cocktails is all about. It's how do you share this beautiful thing with so many people and bring the world to where you are. So um, I call this cocktail one for Murray. Um, the joke is you serve it with a little uh, $20 bill on the side or a $1 bill, whatever you got and write, please take care of my friends. Uh, so that's what I made. I love that. I, I love that so much. Um, in, in, in thinking about the last word, you created a cocktail that actually omitted chartreuse. So do you have any rules when you're thinking about recreating a cocktail in terms of, you know, keeping the DNA or the structure the same? Or do you think it's kind of, you know, a free for all? So for me, um, the great thing about this cocktail is it's not just these four liqueurs being put together. It is a four part sour. It's like the, has become the central piece of a four part sour. If you put four things that have this much sugar, this much acid together in some way, it's going to make something that's beautiful. So for me, I'm playing off of the structure of the drink and the way that the um, acids and the sugars and the flavors all balance each other. So while it's not necessarily uh, like a final word variation where you're switching out whiskey and lemon. This is switching out the core, not necessarily the core elements, but pieces of the elements and bringing them in. So whenever I have a guest come in and ask for something, I'm like, oh, this is a tool I can use. I know that the last word is feels this way. So if I kind of bring things that have those feelings together, it's going to be similar. It's still going to evoke the same kind of thought and uh, time and place. Absolutely. Well, cocktails are definitely a feeling. You have created such a beautiful version of the last word, and I appreciate your friendship. So, Sante, and I hope to see you soon in person. Too. Cheers. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the journey through 20th century cocktails through the lens of liqueurs. I hope to see you soon. And until then, Sante.